distributor um, that used to also be a record store in London. So in addition, the UK, it's the difference between single titles and catalog offerings. It's, it's sort of that. If you're a label, it's best to go to a distributor with your entire catalog. And the best way to approach a distributor is to make sure that you have a release schedule. It's not good to show them what you've put out. It's more good to show them what you're going to put out. They kind of care about what they can make money off of, not what they can't make money off of. So obviously history is important, but forward thinking and having marketing plans as a label to say I'm putting out X amount of titles in this fiscal year is pretty important. And when, when, when I negotiate or when I um, work with distributors, that seems to be what they're interested in talking about more often than not. So how, oh, it's funny. I, I did a similar presentation that was UK and Europe, so there's a little bit of <laughs> Europe-based stuff. But the rule of thumb in the UK and how Europe listens, essentially the UK, if you succeed in the UK, it's a lot easier to translate that success to the rest of Europe. Um, but if you're big in another territory in Europe, the UK couldn't care less. Simple. The UK is its own country, is its own world, and it very, very, very much only listens to itself. We have artists that have sold hundreds of thousands in France that can't bring 30 people to a show in London. And it's, uh, and it's, I can't explain why, it just is. But if you can develop an infrastructure in the UK, because most of the pan-European companies are based in London, when it comes to booking agencies, labels, I would say between 80 and 90%, it's a lot easier to translate that success across Europe. Or at least translate that infrastructure. It doesn't mean you're going to succeed. But, uh, but it doesn't work the other way that I've seen. The only exception to the rule is there are some agencies in Germany and in the Netherlands that book in the UK. So what to expect from licensing opportunities? Um, it's tough. Every deal is different, as I've seen, and I'm not one negotiating them. That's for the label operators. Um, but for the most part, what I've seen is obviously, like anything, they will try to get you to pay for as much as possible. But you have to make sure that the label, that the product is properly time-framed and properly marketed. As an independent artist, to properly market a product, i.e. you're getting it distributed or you're going through an independent label and you want to hire press, you want to hire radio, maybe a marketing person, on the low end you're looking between three and four thousand pounds. On the low end, on the high end, it can go much, much higher than that. <laughs> tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands, if you're looking at signing with an imprint a major. And a lot of times, these labels will try to get their costs back. Especially in the independent world, they will, essentially, they will pay for it and then claw their money back. So you're going to be paying for it in one way or another anyways. So you have to be incredibly careful about the contracts that you choose to sign. Just simple. Everything should be looked at by a lawyer. Everything. It's worth the money. And Make sure that every decision that you make when it comes to signing your product away in a different territory to someone else is a decision that you do not take lightly. Main, it's very, very, very important because especially in the UK, you have one chance to be new. Really one chance to be new. The UK is a very, it's a very fast paced market and they're always looking for the new thing pretty much across all genres. Folk, not so much but across everything else. They're always looking for the next new thing. And the new thing could last six weeks, it could last years, depending on how the brand is accepted. And I'll go into media in a few minutes about that. So you have to be very, very careful about your entry point, about how you show yourself as being new. Because if your first album doesn't do well, it's gonna be very, very, very hard to get that second album off the ground. It does happen, but rarely. And that's what I've seen. So, and I've spoken about the parallel music industries in the UK. This is really important. You have to make sure that you're going to the person that makes sense for your product. And in the UK, everyone works in their own little world. All these music industries sort of function. It's, it's amazing how in the folk worlds, um, in some ways, there are folk clubs that book a year in advance, sometimes a year and a half in advance. <laughs> and in the indie world, you can get a show three weeks before. And in the and a DJ can book in a week before sometimes. And these are different people handling these different parts of the industry. So, and they seem to be very, very, you know, careful to mingle. That's sort of how I'm seeing it, especially when it comes to radio. When it comes to who you pitch yourself to what radio DJ, 
in the UK, because radio is very important in the UK, you have to be careful who you're pitching to because uh, those are the people that are going to champion you the most if you can get in. And there are some DJs that are, are historically been fantastic towards Canadian music, but it depends on what style. And again, you have that one chance to be new. If you, if you fuck it up, <laughs> then they're going to go on to the next person. So the importance of a team. Like anything, you're going to put a record out in Canada or you're going to uh, try to you know, develop product. You have to make sure that you have, well, the financial sustainability, whether that's through public or private funds, and you have the right people to promote it, right? It's the same thing in the UK. It, it's, and it's hard. It's a bit of a chicken and egg sometimes. It's hard. Sometimes a booking agent won't talk to you until you have a radio plugger who you know, won't talk to you until you have a record deal. It's like getting that first champion is very difficult. But if your music's good, it will happen. And it's usually harder to get a booking agent on board than it is to get a radio plugger or a press person because you just pay a press person or a radio plugger to do the work. But booking agencies work on percentages. So they have to put more of a vested interest in your career because they're not going to make money if you play to 50 people in a basement in London. And there's a lot of 50 people capacity basements in London. <laughs> and, uh, but the publicist and the radio plugger, they're going to make their money anyways because you sign a contract saying, I'm going to pay you 2,000 pounds to press a single in an album. And um, you know, you're going to pay them. Booking agents, they have to be in it for the long haul, essentially, or see that. So they're usually harder to get on board. And you have to understand that. And you have to make sure that you read and listen to the cataloged and the rosters that, the, that these agents have. Most, as I said, most of the pan-European agents are based in London. There's, you guys could correct me, but I think there's eight to 10 major booking agents. There's the agency group, which exists here. There's CODA. There's um, Creative Artist Agency, which actually just took in Helter Skelter, which is closing in July. There's Elastic Artists. Um, there, are, and then that's in the indie world. In the folk world, there's Asgard, there's Adastra. There's, um, there's Mammoth in the metal world. There's so many. But again, they, they are, those are the main ones. And then there's loads and loads of small ones as well. In the folk world, there's a guy named Bob Patterson who's really good for, for folk artists and who has booked several Canadian artists in the past. There in, in, the, uh, in the indie world, I would say Ross Warnock at the agency group seems to book half of Canada sometimes, or Nigel Hassler at uh, Creative Artists. But you have to understand, make sure that you look at their roster and listen to their roster and you're pitching appropriately. Because again, once you pitch that one time, that's your chance. And these agents are really busy, or they make you feel like they're really busy. <laughs> so trust me. So hiring a publicist to cover the bases. Ignore the whole and the languages thing. I'm sorry, that's depending on what territory you're marketing in. But OK, since we're all dealing with English uh, in the UK, there are hundreds of publicists, hundreds. I've counted 177 in my database. Some are great, some are crap. Um, the high and and like anything, the more you pay, the better you get. You know, the the most expensive is is Barbara Sharon, who was Madonna's publicist, and she could charge up to fifty thousand dollars for a campaign. But you know, that's at that end, you're usually looking at covers of of major magazines. The press is very important in the UK, and there's lots of it. There's again, there's eight eight or nine daily newspapers. They're split between tabloids. Oh, hey Val, they're split between uh, tabloids and broadsheets. So the tabloids are the ones with you know naked girls on page three and are crap, but they all do music coverage. The Daily Star, the Daily Mirror, the Sun, and then there's the Guardian, the Times, even the Daily Mail, which is a, a very right wing. My we refer to it as the Daily Bigot, but the very right wing newspaper. They have music coverage every Friday, and you have to have a press person who understands this and knows where to pitch. And again, it's doing your research and looking at their roster and understanding who. I'm not going to sit here and tell you who's best for what. You can ask me later. But one thing is it's always best to go for a publicist that covers, I think, this is my personal opinion, that covers the whole spectrum. Because there are national publicists, there's regional publicists, there's online publicists, there's even brand publicists. There's people who will try to get your, you know, your music aligned with, with brands. The best companies seem to be offering full service solutions. And these services are more expensive. And you usually pay per 
what you choose to get. So 